Okay, welcome back to Grey Area. Uh, my name is Luca and I'm very happy to have Tony Y not with me today, um, otherwise known as Mimi. So uh, how are you doing? How are you, how are you feeling today? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm here back in Brooklyn. I was in Germany for a while before Christmas and now I'm back in the States. Really, really had a wonderful Christmas and yeah, very excited about this interview. Good, good. Yeah, no, me too. Definitely very happy to have this opportunity. Um, so this interview will be mainly focused around your whole origin story. So it's more about the history of how you got into music um, and how you ended up where you are today, really, as a musician. So, um, so yeah, to start things off, um, as a child, thinking back to childhood, as a child, um, was your music taste influenced by your friends and family, or were you kind of you kind of developed your own music taste independently? How did how did things work? Um, yeah, that's a good question. My whole family is very musical. I spent a lot of time with my sister, who's just one year older than me, and I think yeah, being in high school, you're obviously influenced by what your friends are listening to. But I was more. I was listening to a lot of pop punk rock stuff and a lot of other people in my high school were listening to hip hop. So it was always like rock against hip hop type of thing. It was really strange, but I was definitely a little skater girl. And also my oldest sister who's 14 years older than me. She was living in New York at that time. And she came back like bringing albums back from the Fugees or just Jamiroquai. I loved it. I was only like 11 years old listening to his albums on my little Walkman, Sony Walkman, and yeah, definitely was really influenced by my older sister, who was yeah, who was a bunch older than me. Okay, cool. No, that's good to that's good to hear that you've got like those kind of family influences as well. Um, I had a kind of similar situation with my family as well, kind of influencing my music taste. Um, so yeah, it's really cool to hear. Um, so when it comes to club events and kind of the electronic music side of things. Um, can you remember the first club event that you went to that you remember loving? Um, is, there what, is, there, is there a club event that comes to mind um, that you remember loving? Your first, the first club event that you remember loving? Yes, <laughs> actually, very specifically. The first time I, like, my very first rave experience was at Watergate 2013 or 2012. Yeah, it's not that long ago, but I'm also not that old. So <laughs> that was my first rave experience. And I remember um, being into electronic music before that, but I went there with friends and just stayed there till way after sunrise. And it was definitely like, wow, this is so cool. Like my first really going to Berlin clubbing experience was very, very heart opening. Yeah, I can imagine. What, what is it? <laughs> so what was it for Watergate? When it comes to Watergate in particular as a club, because I haven't I haven't been sadly, but what's is there anything um, about it in particular that stands out to you, or or is it a mix of things? What I think I mean, also I lived in Berlin, spent a lot of time now in Berlin as an artist. And I think special about Watergate is I feel like it's very music focused, and it's not about what people are wearing or you know, there's no like this uh, showing up and like looking at people or dressing a certain way I think people just really straight up go for the music and that's it and you're kind of just very private on the dance floor it's dark and yeah, you just go for the, for the music and not for the show and which of course places like that kind of whatever I really love as well and it's so absolutely cool to like you know like be immersed in that whole experience but I think Watergate is mainly just music and I like that and it's funny mentioning Watergate like having my first rave experience there and then when I played there for the first time, just kind of like, whoa, I mean, just going from there to that was so cool. I definitely love, love playing at Watergate. Yeah, that must have been, that must have been crazy to, to, to have that <laughs> shift, that full circle. So when, when was it then that you, that you, you first played at Watergate? When, when was that? 2019, I think. Yeah. Just, right. Yeah. 2019. Amazing. Very, That's so cool. Amazing. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, and um, when it comes to the production side of things, uh, I wanted to ask, can you remember the first track that you ever produced? Um, and, and, and if you can remember that first track that you ever produced, can you describe that first track that you 
that you uh, that you produced. Um, and did your perspective on it change over time when you when you went back to it and listened to it again? You know, several months later or whatever. Mm, yeah, I started producing I think in two thousand eighteen, not that long ago, but I think because I'm working on a lot of music that you, I'm fastly progressing. But I remember maybe it's just my German brain, but it was like, I want to start something and I want to finish it. So the first track I really worked on or I I made was quickly after I started producing. And then that was also the first track I released, Imperfection, I released in 2018. And I remember being so strict to myself. I was like, I need to make this and I also need to mix this. And I, need, I want to do everything myself. I don't want any help from anyone, blah, blah, blah. And listening to this now, listening on Spotify or something, I I mean, I, I still like it, but it's not mixed very well. I could have definitely had some more help. And looking back, I'm like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have been such a perfectionist. I should have had help with that. But I really like because I use my voice. I'm a singer, which um, not a lot of people know, which I'm also working on currently on the album, singing more, using my voice more. But listening back, I'm like, yeah, I should actually that's cool that I used my voice should have done that way more after that. Mm. Well, I mean, it's admirable though, that you actually, you know, I wasn't expecting you to say that actually. It's, it's very admirable that the first track you ever produced, you, you stuck at it and, and got to a point where you were <laughs> happy releasing it. Because I think for, um, I think for, uh, you know, a fair few producers I know, um, you know, you ask them about the first track they produce and they're kind of like, oh, they look like they're in pain because they're thinking back to how terrible <laughs> it was. But it was, you know, it's like some some half-finished thing. And so that is, that I mean, is pretty admirable. I, I agree, though. I, definitely looking back, I'm like, oh, I don't know if this is me anymore, but it was me at the time. and It was perfect at the time. And I think, you know, like looking at everyone's past with every track they've ever made, it's definitely like, yeah, would you produce the same track again? Probably not, but it was you at the time. And I think it's kind of nice to see looking at old pictures and be like, yeah, of course I was younger back then. And yeah, kind of, it's a nice memory. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point actually, uh, when you put it that way. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good way of putting it. Um, so uh, next thing I wanted to, um, to ask you about was kind of when, uh you first fell in love with uh dance music so so was that a was that a sudden a sudden event or did you kind of gradually start getting into dance music more and more, and more mm, as a listener? I, mean, I was always into music obviously obviously but I was always into music playing instruments singing and just very into music but club music is a whole different chapter I think after going to a couple clubs after having nights out and experiencing club culture definitely it started growing on me and also moving to New York and um, just being in New York and meeting a lot of people who work in the music industry here or in the events industry I was like I want to be part of this I think this is cool and and um, yeah I think it kind of grew on me slowly the whole dance music thing mm -hmm also go through going to a lot of festivals and having experience at festivals going to burning man and like you know just experiencing my own creativity and being like i want to like i love this so much i want to this to be me like i want to immerse myself into this experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you mentioned um it, it's it's good that you mentioned festivals actually because I, I um on another kind of topic I wanted to ask you about that too so you mentioned Burning Man um is there a number one festival that you've been to that stands out like what's your favorite festival that you've been to and what makes a great music festival to you oh it's such a hard one but I think yeah definitely Burning Man because it's been such a big part of my life I've been I've been going every year since 2014 it's definitely started being like a like a family thing every year so but Burning Man is not like a typical festival. It's not like, it's not just about music, obviously. So I wouldn't say Burning Man is my favorite festival because it's not a festival like that. But um, I've seen a lot of great festivals. Definitely Fusion in Germany is huge because being from Germany and then going to Fusion after not having lived in Germany for a while and seeing how like people come from all over the world and especially from a lot of parts of Germany and seeing German culture in dance music and immersing, I don't know, it's definitely fusion, but 
but I also really, really love Noisley Festival in the UK. I don't uh, know if yeah. you know that one, but it's it's like have you know techno house and there's side trends, there's drum and bass, there's just a little bit of everything. I really like side trends as well. So I don't know. I definitely um, love Noisley because it's really small. It's only three thousand people, and yeah, definitely the whole colorful. It's not just like I like festivals that are not just about music, and there's a lot of you know other things. It's very colorful. I think festivals is about friendship so going with a good crew with your mates and having fun I think friendship is going with a good crew to festival makes the whole experience yeah I completely agree actually um and also like the people you meet there as well which is something I never um thought about before I'd start going to festivals but but I completely agree yeah it's 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 more than just the music isn't it it's the broader it's the broader um overall experience that links in with lots of different things but um, but I like the fact you didn't okay. just pinpoint one particular festival because to be honest I mean I mean it's probably quite it is quite hard to single out one particular one that's the very best um because they're different okay. in different yes. ways aren't they yeah um, exactly uh very cool so um when did you realize that you wanted to pursue music uh full-time you know was there what, what was that what was that was there a shift in your life where you thought, oh, I'm going to actually start really taking music more seriously? Mm, I think I always wanted to become a pop star when I was a child. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I think everyone wanted that, of course. But um, I mean, I did a I did a bachelor's degree, did a master's degree here in New York. Like I, I did uh, work not in music uh, for a while, but I think... Uh, I mean, when did that start? I think once I started taking pressure off myself and also when my dad passed away a couple of years ago, I think my whole perspective on what am I supposed to do in life and following your passion. And I do have a lot of a lot of freedom with that, of course. So yeah, maybe it's a hard one. I think it just also just develops over time. Obviously now in the pandemic, it's very difficult to be a musician full time. Mm. But um I definitely want to do this full time and mm. not do anything else. Yeah. I don't know when it actually started, but I think around 2017, mm -hmm. a little bit after that. Around about that point. Right. Okay. Okay. And you, when you touching on, um, on COVID as well, with regards to pursuing music full time, of course, it's a very important point you touched on there as well. Um, uh, you know, massive amount of respect for, for all the musicians that have managed to, you know, keep their passion alive. And you're, you're definitely a case in point there, a massive, massive example um, of that. So, so that is another big one to, to mention. Um, so I wanted to go back to your first release. I know we touched on that a bit earlier on. Um, so when it came to that first release, your first track that you put out. I know you said it was the first project you actually worked on as well, coincidentally. Um, yes. But were you were you were you set from the very beginning that okay, this is this track that I'm working on, this first track, I'm going to release it no matter what, or were you kind of on the fence? Were you thinking, okay, maybe I'll release it, maybe I won't release it, or but what was your what was your thought process around about that time when you were, you were releasing the track? Um. I was so stuck on I have to release this thing now. <laughs> I just want to find a label. Um, yeah, I worked on a couple of tracks and finished them. Definitely had a bit of a mentor who was like, who has said stuff to all the time. He was a bit annoyed. Like, just, do you like this? Do you like that? Just when you first get really excited about something. But I finished a couple of tracks. And then two of them, I just really pushed out to labels. And not knowing many people in the music industry, I just really looked you know just googled email addresses like really sent it to random labels I know maybe if you want to break as an artist you should you know wait till you're a bit better at what you're doing and then you know also think about strategic strategically who what labels you want to work with and stuff but I was just like any labels really <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I don't know and that in retrospect if that was smart or not but it just happened and you know it's just part of part of what's what happened and there's no going back and changing it 
Yeah, of course. And, you know, and, 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 and I think it's completely relatable what you're saying as well. You know, when you, when you, when you've got a track and you want to get it out there, you've got to get it out there no matter what, you know, and, um, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's good as well that you, you, uh, you mentioned kind of labels as well and the, and the idea of kind of what the best approach is with regards to labels as a, as a, as an upcoming artist early on um, in your career, all of that stuff. Because when it comes to labels, you mentioned in, a, in another interview um, that you think it's uh, that you uh, think it's important to really follow what you love to make, and not what could fit into a certain label when it comes to uh, musicians making their music. Um, mm. And I think that's a really good uh, good statement actually you made there. I think I think I, I definitely agree with what you're saying, um, and it got me thinking. So, so some labels in the past have been criticised for um, kind of broadening out and starting to feature music and release music that is from a broader range of genres, right? Um, mm-hmm. so, they, so they start off these labels as being quite specific to a particular genre. And then over time, they start to uh, release music from artists from all sorts of different genres. And, they, and sometimes they get criticized for that, but I, I, was interested on, I was interested to hear what your views are on that. Do you think that labels should specifically release music from a specific genre or do you think that it's good for labels to be quite open-minded and broad and you know feature artists from a really broad spectrum of genres what 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 do you reckon Hmm, it's a good question i think as a label it's cool when they're very niche focused on something it's also easier for you know fans to follow that label because it's not like some weird twist where all of a sudden it's you know releasing a lot of different genres or subgenres or whatever um i like it when a label stays true to like a like a specific thing but um i think as an artist i think it's cool when an artist opens up a bit more to different subgenres or you know just broadens broadens it up a bit because a label is a label label is not a person but an artist is a person is you know some someone wrote on social media once because I'm dealing with a couple of health issues and I was very vocal about it and someone messaged me someone I don't know messaged me like can you just talk about music and it's like no I'm you know maybe I'm Tony why not but I'm also Mimi and I'm just one person and you know I just talk about my personal stuff it's not just a brand that I'm representing so I think it's cool if if, if an artist you know has a little bit of a plot twist sometimes and just does it a bit differently but for labels I think since a label is not a person maybe they could just stick to what they're doing and um, maybe it's a bit confusing when they broaden up sometimes and sometimes you don't really know what the intention behind it is is it to be more co- you know commercialized or is it about money is it about just really wanting to be more open or yeah mm-hmm. I, I don't know <laughs> No, I no, I think I think that's yeah. I completely agree with what you're saying. Actually, you know, I think I think it is important to distinguish between labels and artists, and um, and also I, I I completely believe that you know uh, you know a, a musician an artist is is a person as well. So it's important for everything from their music to their social media posts to reflect that whole person, not just to be you know, solely the music. I, I don't think you can detach those two things, basically. So I can com- I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, so also touching on that, um, I know that uh, you, you posted as well on social media at one point not too long ago about how, you know, you were considering, you know, um, maybe creating a new alias um, to release kind of maybe a slightly different type of music that you were working on, like your album that you're working on right now, for example. Um, mm-hmm. you decided to stick to Tony why not um, and just you know release whatever music you want basically and I, and I think that's the best thing to do um, but do you think that um, do you think that uh, as an artist making music um, you know all artists and all musicians are essentially limitless and, and they should release whatever they want whenever they want or do you think that do you think there comes a point when maybe it's good to um, start a new alias to, to release different types of things? I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just it's just interesting to to hear what you think. Um, yeah, I want to touch on what you just said about if an artist should just be limitless and free. I think there should be more power to an artist, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking. We're in this age of time where we're talking about 
owning ownership, owning your own music. And I think you back in the day when a label was like, we're releasing four albums with you, you know, like they have so much saying about what you're doing. And I think now as an artist, because you become more present as a persona, also on social media, you you have all the rights. You can do whatever you want. And I think mm. also that is a cool representation as a message to people like, hey, you can do whatever you like. There's no boundaries. There's no limits. So in terms of creating an alias, I mean, sometimes it makes sense. Every artist is different. I think some artists have different aliases and that's cool because that's just, you know, how they present themselves. But at least for me, I, I think it's better to, yeah, just... I, I like it just releasing everything under one name and I think it's cool um, to just show that you're not just stuck to one thing you can be a bit different you can also work with different artists and collaborate with different people even from completely different backgrounds and I don't know just at least for me I like that more yeah no I would agree I think I think it's quite exciting to, to, to you know love an artist and a musician and then not really know what to expect with the next release and it's like a surprise around every turn I personally uh agree with you and I, and I like that more but it is interesting to see the differences in opinion definitely um so in your life as a musician um what's been your happiest moment so far I'm sure there's been lots of different um moments uh, looking back but if you had to say your happiest moment so far in your life as a musician what would it what would it be what would you say um I think oh my god so many good ones just thinking about more of my heart and, <laughs> but I think 2019 playing on the minor warrior at Burning Man was definitely a huge moment for me because I've been looking up, up to playing there for so you know like that was playing there was definitely something where I'm like okay I want to reach that that's like that's a that was a real goal as an artist like okay I would definitely want to reach that point and then getting it getting there so quickly so early in my career was so yeah playing all my friends behind me all these people in front of me and just it was such a magical moment mm. really really loved it just thinking about it makes me so happy <laughs> <laughs> no that sounds amazing that sounds incredible actually um Particularly also, I mean, the fact that all your friends could be with you to share that moment, it sounds like the stuff of dreams, really. It, it sounds incredible. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, so um, I wanted to ask as well, you mentioned um, on, your, uh, on your Instagram, I think it was, that since the pandemic, you've been generally more inspired by music that's not for the club. And um, I was just wondering, is it something that comes to mind in general when, when I'm thinking about electronic music? Um, do you think that electronic music must, by necessity, fit into one of two camps? And those two camps being, you know, uh, music that's for the club, dance floor music, and music that's for home listening. Do you think that electronic mm -hmm. music must fit into one of those two camps? Or do you think that electronic music can transcend that boundary and kind of you know, transcend that boundary? What do you, what do you reckon? That's a really good question. I think there's definitely tra the tra transition thing with it as well. Of course, it's very cool when you play at a club and all of a sudden you play something that you would normally not listen to in a club. And then there's, of course, within club experience, there's like festival sunrise sets, there's opening sets, there's um, yeah, 4 a.m. sweaty club sets. And there's so many different types of settings for club club music or festival or dance music in general. But of course, listening at home is, is also, um, yeah, it, when it comes to electronic music, definitely the home listening music is also very, there's, yeah, there's a whole, whole layover gap with that, I think as well. But at least for the sets that I'm playing, and I think I'm more of a, you know, middle of the night, play a bit harder type of music. At least the music that I like, that I would listen to in a club and also the way I'm struck, my structure, my sets or make my playlist. It's definitely like dance music, club, like club music. And then I have obviously folders for sunrise or whatever, but um, at least the music that I'm listening at home is not always electronic music either. I'm listening to a lot of 80s and you know like in indie rock bands and whatnot but um yeah there's there's a huge 
Yeah, it doesn't need to be separated can also be together at least for the music that i'm making an album that i'm working on is more synth poppy is more not yeah it's, it's still electronic music because it's made on a computer but um i don't know <laughs> it's a good a good thing to think about actually i'm happy that you brought this up oh good yeah no um <laughs> no and i think that's a really good response actually um and uh yeah i think what you said makes a lot of sense um for sure um, I wanted to ask you next about uh, some of the other things that you've been involved in kind of over the years. Um, so you're the co-founder of the Front Left Party series, and you've also been involved in um, the Bay Collective. Um, now, for those who aren't familiar with these, could you explain them in a bit more detail? Um, front left, I think, was a more moment in time thing. I did with a friend. Um, we were playing a lot together in 2018, 2019. Yeah, and we just did a couple parties in New York. So it wasn't really anything crazy. Um, we had Manpower once, which was really, really cool. A huge fan of him and actually releasing on his label in a couple months. Very excited. Oh, exciting. Um, but Collective Bay is way more interesting. I wasn't, I didn't found it. I was just co-producing these events. Um, my very dear friend Reem, aka DJ Dreamy, she uh, from New York, she was the one who started Bay Collective and Collective Bay is a collective of, of women, of women for women type of events. And it's not just music, there's poetry reading, there's live painting, there's it's just really cute. So it's not a dance event, it's more just a gathering of community, also very, um, a lot of, uh, you know, influenced by spirituality, meditation, yoga. Um, and it was mainly for women to feel comfortable to express themselves. Of course, men can attend these events too. Um, but that was very, very great. And Reem actually still does these events. And I actually, yeah, I just helped co-producing them. And um, But I identified very much with Collective Bay because it was the first party I've ever played. Um she brought me in, was like, oh, I know you're DJing at home, but do you actually want to play in front of people? And I was like, oh my God, yes, please. And so that was kind of the motivation for me to DJ in front of people and just, um, yeah, step out of there and found a, find a voice. So I, I'm really grateful for her to give me this platform and help me do that for other women as well. It was very great. Um, that's 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 so cool to hear. I wanted to ask, just 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 following on from what you said at the end there um, about how how the collective kind of acted as a platform uh, for you getting into you know uh, DJing live. Um, so, do you think that um, do you think that, that it was really quite helpful then to have that bit of a push um, to to for somebody to actually say to you, you know, I know you DJ at home, but do you want to actually DJ live? Um, do you think it's quite helpful sometimes as an artist to, to have that that push, that external push to actually make the shit absolutely. live? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think it's great to have people who support you, to have mentors, to have people who are a bit further down the line in terms of career, music, knowledge, whatever, who just help you out a little bit. And I definitely had a lot of people in my life that I'm very grateful for that you know give me platforms and give me ways to express myself now I'm I'm big enough to do that myself but um the fact that she reached out to me and you know she like re reached out in general to like who, what women do want to do want to do this and I think it's uh, it's definitely great to have a push I think otherwise it's very intimidating as as a woman in that world to just be like, I want to play now. I mean, New York is also very competitive. I feel like the New York hustle is very intense. It's very different when I moved to Berlin from New York. And, um, where in Berlin, people are more chill. People are like, you know, using opportunities when they come their way. But New York is such a hustler city where everyone just elbow bumps each other. Like, no, I want to play. And oh. so mm -hmm. being in that environment was definitely like, wow, okay, getting that New York hustle vibe on and, Having actually someone who was like, you know what, I'm going to like help you a little bit here. It definitely helped a lot. I think it's great, especially woman, if a woman helps a woman. I think I'm always very, yeah, very 
not touched by it, but just very motivated. Like, yeah, we need to help more women find their way into producing or making music or playing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, what we're going to be moving on to now um, is um, the speed round part of the interview. Um, so, so this is basically a uh, list of about 10 questions. Um, it's a bit of fun. Uh, some of them are a bit silly. And the idea is you kind of just give uh, your response quickly without kind of um, thinking about it too much. You know, you're kind of saying the first thing that comes to mind. Um, so uh, let's get started. So to start off with, what is the one piece of gear that you'd love to own? Oh, that I own or that I would love to own? Is there one piece of gear that you would love to own that you don't own already? I just gifted myself some synths for Christmas, so. Um, okay. What synths did you get? For the grand Moog grandmother, I would love to have that one. Okay. Yeah, definitely. One of the Moogs for sure. Um, that makes sense. Um, if you could only listen to one album for a year, what would it be? be some of these might take a bit longer to think about to be fair but yeah if you could only listen to one album for a year what would it be oh my God. i when you ask like this nothing comes to my mind it's just blank <laughs> That's it, um, yeah. oh my god or do i even know an album name <laughs> Or artists, to be fair, because like, to be honest, sometimes it can be a bit tricky remembering specific album names. I struggle with that sometimes as well. If you could only listen to one artist for a, for a year, who would it be? Mm, the Cure. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, do you prefer a walk in the woods or a dip in the ocean? Dip in the ocean, for sure. Um, rock, music or hip hop? rock music hey okay <laughs> uh, so finish this sentence before i die i want to do what skydive <laughs> mm -hmm, good um likewise uh would you rather be chronically underdressed or overdressed to an event overdressed, overdressed. <laughs> uh winter or summer Summer. I'm a child of the sun, for sure. <laughs> uh, if you had a time machine, uh, which decade would you travel back in time to? Like time 80s, time. of course. 80s, <laughs> 80s. <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this one's, this one's pretty stupid, so, so bear with me. Uh, would you rather have fingers for legs or legs for fingers? <laughs> oh, my God. It's like a silly drunk question. I know. Um, legs for fingers. Fingers for legs? I don't know. No, legs for finger. I don't know. Wait. I don't know. <laughs> fingers for legs. Fingers for legs. Okay. Um, and last one. So name a DJ um, that you'd love to go back to back with. Hair. Love her. Awesome, awesome. Um, brilliant, well, thank you so much. Um, last thing to ask you, so is there anything that you'd like to say to your viewers before you head off? Mm, yeah, how about, um, we're living in a really hard time right now, at least for a lot of people, especially for people in the music industry. And I think, yeah, going inwards and focusing on self-healing and kind of not listening too much to the out the environments is really important. Um, yeah, my heart goes out to everyone suffering from depression and anxiety right now. And stay strong. Just keep believing in yourself. This will not be forever and better times are coming. Just, just trust the process. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.